Wi-Fi is such an important technology to so many of us. I'm sure a lot of you are using your Wi-Fi network to watch this right now. And Wi-Fi itself is just a family of protocols, so multiple protocols, not a single protocol. Um, and it's standardized, which means that it's overseen by a non-profit organization called the Wi-Fi Alliance. They specify the settings of the protocols, how the protocols work together, what a device needs to do to be Wi-Fi certified. And this means that this, stand this standardization is international. If you go on holiday to another country, their Wi-Fi is working in the exact same way as your Wi-Fi at home. And it means that the devices can be used with Wi-Fi networks anywhere in the world because they all adhere to the same standardized family of protocols. Wi-Fi itself uses wireless transmission, of course, and so it uses waves through the air. The transmission medium is the air for Wi-Fi. And the type of waves are radio waves in this case. A generic name for a Wi-Fi, a wireless network, not just a Wi-Fi network, is a WLAN, a wireless local area network. You may see that some languages use that as the term for Wi-Fi instead of Wi-Fi, like German uses WLAN to mean Wi-Fi. And these are the two symbols you'll be very familiar with. So radio waves are a type of electromagnetic wave. You've got a long spectrum, as you will know, and the waves are based on their frequency. So visible light is part of a range of frequencies different to X-rays or microwaves or indeed radio waves. Radio waves are a subset of electromagnetic waves and Wi-Fi can be thought of as a subset of radio waves. So it's just a set range of frequency within radio waves. And even within that allocated range for Wi-Fi within radio waves, you have channels, and a channel is a small frequency range within Wi-Fi. So we designate it with a number. So if we've got 12 channels here for Wi-Fi, these are each representing a small range of frequencies. And between one and 12 is the frequency range for Wi-Fi itself within the larger radio wave category. So if we've got three devices here, all trying to broadcast, they, are, they can broadcast at different frequencies. And here, this device here is broadcasting mainly in channel 11, but due to the nature of waves, they can spread out even in terms of frequencies. So it's also slightly in 12 and 10 and even nine and 13 here. But these two devices here are both mostly broadcasting on the same channel and they're interfering. So that can be a reason why Wi-Fi is slow is because you've got multiple devices that are broadcasting, trying to use the same frequency range and it's interfering and you need to retransmit the data which slows everything down. So because these channels overlap, they may cause interference, so you need to space the frequencies out when you're broadcasting. And often the first thing, well, the first thing I do when my internet's slow is to restart the router. And this often improves the situation because when the router starts up, it will find the channel with the least transmission in it to make it um, less likely it's gonna interfere. And this will often speed up the network. One of the key issues with wireless transmission is because the data is going via the air, anyone in that general vicinity, anyone in the range can access that data and unless it's encrypted can read it. Whereas in a wire you have to be actually physically connected to the wire to be able to see the data. But it's much easier with wireless transmission which is why encryption is really important and is enabled by default. So Wi-Fi uses a encryption protocol called WPA, Wi-Fi Protected Access and in fact in 2006 the second version came in which fit, fixed some weaknesses of the first version and in fact there's a third version that's just been int introduced which has fixed again a few issues. So this encrypts it and ensures that people who view the packets cannot understand the contents of the packets because it's unreadable and only the two intended devices can actually decrypt and view the data. Encryption is therefore a pretty essential step to making Wi-Fi secure. Two other less essential but still important and still commonly used methods are, or the first of which I should say, is disabling the public SSID broadcast. And the SSID is the service set identifier, which is the name that the network has essentially. So when you join a network, you select the name of your router and you can change the name to a just plain text or it will have the default BT571 whatever. But this is the name that your network has, the service set identifier. And when you can view it in a list, it's being broadcast. And you can disable this. You can stop your wireless router from broadcasting the name of the network. And this is called network cloaking, or you can just say it's about disabling the broadcast. But this is only going to stop inexperienced hackers. And that's because packet sniffing software um, can still view the SSID in the header of packets. So it's non. It, 
the SSID is sent in packets non-encrypted. Even if a packet itself is encrypted, it's sent in plain text via SSID. So if you are a hacker who has ability to download free sniffing software, you're going to be able to view the SSID. So it might stop your next door neighbor trying to guess your password, but it's not going to stop an actual hacker from detecting your network. Another commonly cited but also I would say futile method is to program your router with a MAC address whitelist. And either we have covered or will cover what a MAC address is in more detail, but just to summarize, it's a unique address every device connected to a network has. In fact, it's, co it's hard coded into the network interface card. So every device that is connected to a Wi Fi network will have its own MAC address, and so, and a unique MAC address as well, in theory. So if you have a whitelist, a whitelist is a list of acceptable entities, so acceptable MAC addresses, a blacklist is where you are barring certain people or certain addresses. So we're programming a router with a list of MAC addresses which is acceptable and, and who's allowed to connect to the network. So to do this process you've got to go and collect all the MAC addresses which might not be that easy to do on some devices and the MAC address itself is an alphanumeric long string so it's not very easy to deal with. And then you've got to program it into the router somehow using probably an online interface which is often quite clunky to deal with. So not a very fun process to do. And even so, it's not necessarily that effective. You can, they're meant to be unique worldwide wide MAC addresses, but you can alter your MAC address to, to another one. So you can change your MAC address or certainly an experienced hacker would be able to do that. And like the SSID, it's available publicly. So just by using sniffing software, you can view the MAC addresses in the packets because the MAC address is used to actually reach the endpoint so the packet can forward it so the router can forward it to the right device so an attacker can observe the network and see that certain MAC addresses are used quite often and you can infer from that that those MAC addresses are part of this whitelist so they're allowed to interact with the network you can then change your own MAC address to match one of these accepted MAC addresses and gain access to the network so not very effective in that way you're probably asking why I've just spent five minutes talking about two methods which aren't very effective and of course the answer is that the exam board say we have to. But I suppose the rationale is that if people are giving bad advice it's our job as computer scientists to make sure they're actually spending their time enacting useful security measures rather than measures which aren't going to be very useful. So encryption is definitely definitely the most important method for securing Wi-Fi and if people spent more time setting up slightly better encryption that would be much more effective than either of these methods. Just to look at the two bits of hardware needed to form and use a wireless network. First of all, you've got to have a wireless network adapter to join a network. So generally speaking, just to connect to any network, you need to have a network adapter in your device, also known as a network interface card. So when I was saying that every device has its own unique MAC address, the network interface card or the network adapter is what's actually got the MAC address. So it belongs to the network adapter, which looks can look like a USB dongle like this which has just got a little wireless adapter in it also it can be a PCI card, it can be built into your computer as well so different forms but they all will bridge the gap between the network and your device so it's got to convert the signals, in this case wireless signals into the electronic readable format which your computer uses a wireless network adapter then can send and receive the radio waves that's fairly important and for Wi-Fi, it's sending them in that set frequency range we talked about at the beginning. To actually create, to actually form the network, you need to have a wireless access point, a WAP. And this device is what converts the wireless connection to the wired connection. You still need to have some wires in your network uh, to be able to connect to the internet or, or whatever. The whole internet isn't wireless, of course. So the wireless access point is what bridges this gap. And again, will convert from radio waves to the electrical waves. Electrical waves the electricity used in the wires and pretty much all will use Wi-Fi but because Wi-Fi isn't the same as wireless you can't say every wireless access point is using Wi-Fi. It's going to be a device that looks a bit like this and it can be a standalone device so it can be packaged into be part of a router and of course that makes the router a wireless router. In your home the wireless router might have sufficient range for you to be more than happy but in a large network you might have to add several wireless access points together in order to have enough range to cover everyone. So in your school you might have one of these devices in each classroom or in each hallway and that will make sure that everyone has access to the Wi-Fi.